can it be that I should be the one to have to follow John Green? <laughs> Thank you, Brother John, for opening our eyes deeper to the realization that we do face temptations. We are in fiery trials, but we have deliverance. And had it not been for him who died on Calvary, where would we be today? I want to say thanks on behalf of my wife and myself for the hospitality that has been extended to us in these days that we have been privileged to be with you, Faith Baptist Church, and this Summer Bible Conference with all of those that have been guests, those that have stood behind this sacred desk to preach God's Word. I thank you for that opportunity from the depths of my heart. I thank you, Brother David and Sister Mary, for our friendship over these many, many years uh, and the opportunity uh, that we have shared from time to time. And sometimes it's uh, a great uh, distance of time and space, but uh, our thoughts are with you. It's always a joy to hear Brother David's voice on the phone, uh, get an email, and uh, these other brethren that uh, we have uh, met and then grown to love in the Lord. If you uh, have your Bibles open to the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, as Brother uh, Cadman so uh, aptly introduced uh, in that first sermon, I want to call attention uh, to uh, this prayer because of its uh, wording in the English language for us. In the Greek, we don't have punctuation. Uh, and I'm thankful that we do have punctuation uh, from the scholars that have given to us. And sometimes uh, when we read uh, in the original, we, we have to stop and pause and say, where does one phrase in and another phrase begin? Uh, there's something interesting about the way that our English scholars have given it to us in the King James. If you notice, Brother Cadman called attention to one of the punctuation marks in the very beginning of this prayer. Uh, he said in verse number 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. And then notice what follows that ye. There's a code, right? And then notice at the very end, this is the part that I have been assigned, and I trust that if you will labor with me, we will look at it in some detail. At the very end of this prayer, you'll find what is called a doxology. Now many of the modern translations omit it. I think that's a travesty. I really do. The received text has it. So that's why we have it in the King James. It is a reminder and notice at the conclusion of what Brother Green read for us. Notice these words. But deliver us from evil. And what's the punctuation? A code. Now when I was taught grammar, when you use a code, you have some things that follow in explaining the previous. And so, in what we call the doxology, we have an affirmation of what has been previously given between the first colon and the second colon. We have an all-inclusive doxology. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen or amen, depending on how you want to pronounce those four letters. It is wonderful. 
Now, I think that it's important for us to understand historically the setting of the doxology. I think we have to go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and look at this as being what we call the basis of this doxology. The Chronicles give us something of the nature of the mindset. Remember, this is a book written to Jewish hearers. Matthew. Recording by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to a Judy Jewish audience. And so their mindset is thinking about the way that they would offer up the what we would call understanding of there is but one God and their testimony of their knowledge of God and their praise to God. So 1 Chronicles chapter 29, if you would turn there, I want to read these verses. Beginning in verse number 11. Thine, O Lord, now, again, the context, David's blessing the congregation. In verse number 10, he says, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. And then here's this doxology of praise. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is the power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Now, I don't have any problem whatsoever making a transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament concept that Jesus is admonishing his hearers to pray. Don't exclude praise in your prayer. Amen. And we understand that from the very beginning all the way through to this great doxology of praise. Now it's interesting that Jesus uses the present tense in this doxology. Not thine was, not thine will be, but thine is. Present active, linear, continuous, is, present tense. Now, I don't have a problem understanding God's usage of present tense. Why? Because He is the I am. Always. He isn't the was, He isn't the will be, He is the is. I can use that language, isn't it? Wonderful that He is the ever-present I Am. Now remember, I mentioned in one of my sermons that when Moses was told to go back to Egypt, God told him to tell <coughs> Pharaoh who had sent him. I am that I am. God is always in the present tense. Now we may, from our human perspective, talk about the past, right? eternity past, and we talked about eternity future. But God doesn't deal in that. He deals in the ever-present I am state. The is state. Thine is what? The kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory for ever a me. Now I believe that Jesus included this so that we who pray, believing, can pray with this understanding we are praising Him who lives forever and ever and ever. This is our praise. And so we begin with this first phrase, Thine is the kingdom. Now it was assigned to me ironically 
to preach on the subject thy kingdom come and it's my assignment to still deal with God's kingdom at the end and I thank you brother David for allowing me to get the opportunity because I don't think I have the capacity nor do I think any other preacher has the capacity to fully exhaust what it means to deal with the kingdom of God. I don't think we can in a message, two messages. In fact, I would go on to say in a lifetime, I don't think we can exhaust what it really involves to deal with the kingdom of God. We know what it means. He reigns. That's what it means. That's what David said, right? Over in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. He reigns how long? Forever. How long is His kingdom? It means these words. God is reigning universally over all men and all things. If I'm praying about God's name being hallowed, I'm praying about His kingdom coming. I'm praying for our daily bread. I'm praying for forgiveness of sin. I'm praying that I not, might not be led into temptation. And if I am led into temptation, He's going to deliver me. I know it's true that He's reigning. The Lord God <coughs> omnipotent reigns. He has a kingdom. And I don't want to go over all of those things. But I know that when we talk about God's universal kingdom, it means that it is a special kingdom. Especially to those who are His saints. We have a relationship with Him. And this kingdom is God's by eternal right and infinite purchase. We sometimes forget as a reward for the sufferings of Christ, His obedience and His death, God gave to Him a mediatorial kingdom. He's reigning over that mediatorial kingdom right now. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for His saints, for those who are believers. Right now, it's a mediatorial kingdom. Kingdom. And one day, according to 1 Corinthians 15, He's going to deliver that mediatorial kingdom to His Father. Amen. After all enemies have been put down, the last enemy is dead. He's going to conquer that. In fact, I believe it's already conquered. Amen. Up from the grave He arose. Victorious for his foes. Hallelujah. What a Savior He is. And we we come every Lord's Day morning and evening. The Lord's Day is the celebration of the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. It's not one day out of the year that we celebrate the resurrection. It's every Lord's Day we Amen. celebrate. In fact, it's every day we awaken from our sleep of rest. And we have a new day awaken us. But more especially on the Lord's Day, we assemble as the saints of God and we worship Him who is risen from the dead. He is alive. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within me. He lives within you, the resurrected Savior. And He is reigning over us. Jesus understood this mediatorial kingdom was only for a season. And God had given Him that authority to execute judgment. And so all judgment having been committed to His Son will one day usher in the kingdom of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the glorious state in which all the saints of God will enjoy their reign with Him. Remember when I preached about this kingdom, there are many heirs but no successor. Why? Because God reigns eternal. He's the one that's on the throne. We should pray, Thy kingdom come. And that kingdom of glory would hasten as did John so 
declare. But he said, Thine is the kingdom. Not a kingdom, but one and only kingdom, the kingdom of glory. And all of this, remember, is connected. Grace and glory, right? Bring us all to that ultimate culmination. When we hear the trumpet sound, and we know that the voice of the archangel has been heralded all across the world. Now, don't throw stones at me. I want to tell you when that day is going to come. When the last elect has been called for. Now I preach that. And so far no one's gone to stone that. And I pray that you don't go out to the parking lot and find some in Pearl Man. I'm serious about this because I do believe that when the last of God's chosen has been called for and has been gloriously brought to illumination and regenerating. Why go any longer? Think about it. It's no need, is it? Now who is the last one? I have no earthly idea. Only God knows that. But that is His kingdom. And He will have that power over me one day. One day, it's going to happen. I believe that promise that Paul recorded. That the trumpet will and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the kingdom that I'm looking forward for all eternity. Are you? Amen. It is the Lord's. He said so. Thine is the kingdom. Now, I want to back up and look at one little preposition. We can affirm this prayer because of that one little preposition for. Now we can also translate it because. That's exactly how we can translate. We can pray this prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer, but it's also referred to as the model prayer. After this man of praying, our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth or on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory forever. The second point, thine is the power. Jesus gave to his disciples the great commission in Matthew 28. And he gave that commission following a word of affirmation. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Power belongs to the Lord. We do not win any battle here on earth by our own might. Our power comes from the Lord. That's why the psalmist said, The Lord is my strength. Of whom shall I be afraid? And that's why the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Romans, he is going to write with an affirmation. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God. Now, I do like the Greek word that represents power. It's the word that we get the English word dynamite from. I like it, don't you? Yeah. The Greek word is dunamis. It is the power. It's an exploding power. It belongs to the Lord. And we've already learned this week that God is omnipotent. Right? Now that omnipotence is demonstrated in His sovereignty all over that which He has that reigning power. Right? We call it dominion. If He's reigning, it's his kingdom, he has dominion, and he exercises that power.
power. He has the authority. Now, when we talk about his sovereignty, we are understanding this sovereignty from different perspectives. And in God's kingdom, we understand that he is exercising particular kinds of power and authority. For example, he will exercise such power that in that kingdom, there will be no corruptive forces allowed. None. That's that power. That he is going to exercise no restraint in keeping out he will fully keep out all corruptive influences. That's his power. He will make sure that by his power, all divisions will be eliminated. We sometimes, in our uh, own particular settings of life, see division. There are divisions in churches. You know, churches have divided over such things like uh, how many pews are you going to have in the sanctuary? Or what color of carpet are you going to have? Which side the piano is going to be placed on? Did you know that? They even get divided on what time you have service. Or how long service is going to be. Uh, I mean, there, these things are divisions that... You know, and, and the Bible instructs us that there not be any divisions among us. And it's only in God's realm of dominion that His power will be exercised in such a way we will be at peace. And there will be no divisions. <clears throat> no. We will be thinking a lot now. That's hard for me to imagine. Disagreements are part of our persona, our natural way of thinking down here, right? If you don't believe me, you just start talking about subjects like politics and see how far we can get. Uh, economics, right? You get people divided over that, right? You, you just name anything that you want to name and you can get people divided. God's going to exercise a power that will end all divisions. Those of us who could hardly pray together down here will be together with the Lord, right? We will be in perfect harmony. God's going to exercise such a power that He's going to separate the goats from the sheep, the wheat from the tares. There will be no influence of the wicked over there. None. That's His power. Thine is the power. And so, when we talk about this power of God, it's perpetual and unmovable. Can we stand up against God? We have no power against the One who is called the Mighty. That's who He is. Can God justly dispose of all things? I believe He has that power. If He can say, let there be light, and Genesis records, and there was. Right? He who is eternal said, let there be light, and there was. And He said, let there be a son, to rule by day and let there be moon and stars to rule by night. You know what's interesting about that statement? It took about 3,500 years for scientists to finally understand about the solar system. But the Hebrew already knew it. The moon does not give light of itself. That's the Hebrew word lesser. Isn't that marvelous? Yeah. There is nothing new under the sun. God claimed it that way. It's His power. Right? Nations come and nations go by the will of 
God, the power of God. And so when we come to this prayer ending, this doxology of praise, what are we saying? God, you and you alone exercise this power over this vast universe. And I tell you, that steadies my prayer when I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not coming in my power. I'm not coming in the power of some other human being. I'm coming under the power of God. That's why Paul understood this dunamis, the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. He is a mighty working God who is there in our behalf. Our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was clothed with all the sensibilities, all the affections, and all the sympathies of our natures. And in all points was He tempted as we are yet without sin. And we have that high priest, my dear friends, seated in the heavens, making intercession for us in our behalf. And so we shouldn't come to God thinking that God's a wimp, weak, and weary unable to do. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we ask or even think. Hallelujah. Amen. To the one who has the power. Not some power, but all power is in Him. And so I don't have the fear of coming to the throne of grace because I know that prayer as it leans upon His power, I am coming to Him seeking. I petition. That's why I come both to find help in time. Let me read for you a song that I think in some ways uh, gives us an idea of the our need to come to God in this manner. Psalm 28. And I'm not going to read all of it, but I just want to read a couple of verses from it. Verse 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, we can interpret that as my strength, my, my anchor, holy force. Be not silent to me, lest thou be silent to me. I become as those that go down into the pit. Now go down to verse 8. Oh, excuse me, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him and I am held. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices. And with my song will I praise Him. The Lord is their strength and He is the saving strength of His anointed. That's power, my dear friends. And we know that there is power in the blood. Right? We do not hesitate. Go to the power of the one who loved us. with the magnitude of our praise as David did before his last plan and the sheep. But this prayer about solid also includes the glory. For thine is the power, thine is the glory. It says right. First it says, Thine is the kingdom, then the power, and then the glory. To whom belongs glory? Who alone is to receive glory? God. Right. Only to God be the glory. All honor, all reverence, all love, all thankfulness are do to Him and to Him alone. Now we do thank our own 
acquaintances and relationships for various things. But we acknowledge this. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His holy name. If it had not been for God, we would not even have the breath to give thanks for anything that we have. We know that. We give to Him that praise. Now, God's glory is spoken of in the Bible in two ways. One is called intrinsic glory. That's the glory that is in and of Himself. He requires no one else to give Him that glory. And sometimes we who are humans would say these words, His, his intrinsic glory is reflected in His attributes. And more particularly incommunicable attributes. Those that belong to God and to God alone. His intrinsic glory could be summed up by saying this, it is the revelation of all that God is. We fail in trying to describe all that God is. Why? Because the Bible says, Who is the right man that can know the mind of God? So we only have a limit to do. Now we know that there are two ways God reveals Himself, right? We call this His special revelation, right? The, the Bible. And we also call general revelations that we see. The heavens declare the glory of God, right? Firmament is handiwork. And we see that. And so that all men are left without any excuse about God. Now Romans 1 says those people who knew God chose not to acknowledge God and so they began to worship idols and whatever else, right? They began to worship the corruptible instead of the incorruptible, right? And so what does God do? He turns them over to a reprobate mind. To do all of these horrible Blasphemous, wicked things that are an abomination to God. And yet, God is going to get glory out of all of that. Did you know that? Now, I don't comprehend that fully. I only can see darkly right now. But we know it is the sum total of all of His divine perfections in nature, His glory. That's His intrinsic. But this is not what. Jesus is talking about here. Did you know that? It isn't. If I understand the prayer correctly, He is talking about something different. This is called His ascribed glory. We cannot do anything to add to God's intrinsic glory. It's beyond us. All we can do is ascribe to Him the glory that is due His name. Amen. We just pronounce with our lips, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise be unto the Lord. Hallelujah. And on and on we go. Because you see, He is who He is. I can't add anything to Someone who is omnipotent, can you? I can't add to any thing to his omniscience. He knows all. And what does this little pig brain know that can add to the knowledge of God? It fills the earth, doesn't it? As the waters that covers the sea, his knowledge is beyond our comprehension. And so all you and I can do is say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Ascribe to Him the glory due to Him. That's what Jesus is teaching when He said, How to be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And on and on throughout this prayer. It's all about do we recognize beyond the shadow of a doubt that God deserves the lips of our praise. Do our lips praise Him? 
David said, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to walk around with my lips pushed out. And I'm going to take a fight with everybody that says anything to me. That's not what he said. He said, I will rejoice and be glad in you. Are we glad that we are alive today? Do we have breath to breathe? A mind that is sharp.
then he reached down and picked me up and set me on that solid rock. This rock is Jesus. He's the solid rock. We're on a solid foundation forever and ever and ever and ever. There won't be any goodbyes see you later. It's just going to be hello forever and ever and ever and ever. And we are just beginning to get a little glimpse of that in this prayer. When Jesus said, for thine is the kingdom and thine is the power and thine is the glory forever. We're going to worship the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and sing His praises forever and ever and ever and ever. Why? Because He has given to us life everlasting. Forever. We're not just learning to praise Him now. We're learning to praise Him now so we can praise Him forever and ever. We're in the practice session now. We're in the rehearsal. <laughs> That's what we're in. The play is about to open up. And you know, there's not going to be any end. Forever, ever, ever, and ever. And watch. It doesn't end with forever. You know what Jesus ended this prayer with? A me. Or Ami, the way you want to pronounce it. You know what Ami it is? It's the seal of prayer. Jesus taught his disciples to conclude their prayers with a sure affirmation. Amen. It comes from a Hebrew word. Again, this is a Hebrew writing to other Hebrew listeners. And that Hebrew word literally means to be secure and firm. We know it, so be it. It simply means for us today, it is immovably true. Immovable, true. Think about it. God has set His seal of security and firmness. When we respond in prayer, by concluding, Amen. What do we say? You're saying it's immovably true everything we know about God. It's immovably true about His eternal kingdom. It's immovably true, immovably true about His sovereign will, immovably true about His daily bread, immovably true about His pardoning grace, immovably true about His delivering power. Jesus Christ is the Amen to all of that. I think this is what we call the lofty summit to which we have ascended. We have a conclusion by simply fervently affirming that the kingdom, the power, and the glory belong exclusively to Him forever. Our only response is to resoundingly say, and all the people said, Amen. Can you say Amen? Amen. I trust that you can. Because He and He alone has the kingdom. about this wondrous truth that your Father in Heaven, our Father in Heaven is reigning over us with power and glory forever. And with our feeble tongues 
We left this course of practice. I conclude with these words, singular but yet collective.